Welcome to Virtual Exhibitions Technical Workshop 3, Exhibition Design and Virtual Environments. Brought to you by the Digital Empowerment Project, a nationwide initiative organized by the six U.S. regional museum associations and dedicated to providing free, self-paced training resources for small museums. Our inaugural series of online training focuses on digital media and technology topics and is made possible by the funding from And I'm your host for today's program. My pronouns are he, him. I am white, middle-aged male. My hair is brown and styled in a side part comb over. I have a mustache and a goatee. I am wearing a mint green polo shirt today. In the background, there's a gray wall with a teal poster from a 1982 Smithsonian ex exhibit opening and an abstract painting that I picked up in the Gambia. In this era of virtual meetings, when digital spaces may substitute for our physical sense of place, it is important to reflect on the land that we each occupy and honor the indigenous people who have called it home. I am speaking to you from Colorado Springs, Colorado, which includes the historic homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute peoples. Wherever we are each located, please let us acknowledge indigenous nations as living communities. We at the Digital Empowerment Project recognize that our organizations and those of our members were founded within a colonizing society, which perpetuated the exclusions and erasures of many native peoples throughout the United States and beyond. We ask that you reflect on the place where you reside and work and to respect the diversity of cultures and experiences that form the richness of our world and our profession. Thank you. And now a few program notes before we introduce our expert. I'd like to acknowledge today's ASL interpreters and let you know that captioning for this program is embedded in a box just below the YouTube player on our website with controls to adjust your experience. The best way to find areas of, for improvement is to listen to our attendees. So we ask that you share your candid feedback with us. Keep an eye on the chat box for links to a satisfaction survey. Sharing your experience through this survey will only take a few minutes and stands to improve our work. During today's program, we will address as many questions as time allows. However, we encourage you to engage the forum on our website for ideas, answers, and connections with other professionals who share your goals. Create a login and post questions. A member of the community, a presenter, or one of the student technology fellows will get back to you. Lastly, please follow us on social media to be aware of future programs. Keep an eye on that chat. We suggest interacting via the Museum Learning Hub's Watch Live page, but we're happy to have you whichever way that might be. Now let's introduce today's presenter. Dr. Natrice Gaskins is a digital artist, academic, cultural critic, and advocate of STEAM fields. In her work, she explores techno-vernacular creativity and Afrofuturism. Dr. Gaskins teaches, writes, fabs, and makes art using algorithms and machine learning. She's taught multimedia, computational media, visual art, and even advanced placement compu uh, computer science principles with high school students who majored in the arts. She shared a BFA, she, I'm sorry, she earned a BFA in computer graphics with honors from Pratt Institute and an MFA in art and technology from the School of Art Institute of Chicago. She received a doctorate in digital media from Georgia Tech. Currently, Dr. Gaskins is a resident in the Autodesk Technology Center's Outsight Network. She is the assistant director of the Leslie Steen Learning Lab at Leslie University. Her first full-length book, Techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation, was released earlier this month through MIT Press. Gaskins served as board president of the National Alliance for Media Arts and Culture and was on the board of the Community Technology, Community Technology Centers Network. She is currently on the board of Artisans Asylum. Please help me give a hearty welcome to Dr. Gaskins. Thanks for being here, Dr. Gaskins. I'm gonna hand it off to you. Uh, can, I, can you hear me? Sure. Can. Okay, hi, uh, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you're from. I'm going to uh, share my screen and talk about um, uh, exhibitions uh, design. Let's see. OK. 
Okay. And I am going to switch back and forth a little bit, but not at the moment. So um, we get a really good uh, presentation mode should be okay. So I'm talking about exhibition design in virtual environments. And um, this is me. And I want to sort of make sure I define it the way I, I'm thinking about it. It's an online event that's organized on a web-based comprehensive virtual exhibition platform. Uh, it is an easy way to build and design virtual exhibitions in 3D. So, you, um, so the, I think what I'm saying here is the easiest way to build and design virtual exhibitions in 3D um, is to experience virtual 3D. Um, what does that mean? And, and I'm gonna talk about what that means, virtual 3D in a second. Um, so um, when I mean three-dimensional, I also include uh, two-dimensional works on three-dimensional objects like walls. Um, also, there could be 3D sculptures that are um, created in a virtual 3D space by using multiple images in the round um, 360 to create a virtual 3D experience. You can walk around or look around the object um, in the space, even though it's uh, comprised of, of, of multiple images. Um, in terms of preparation is and in, in towards the idea of getting used to the space. There are two um, virtual 3D spaces I want to talk about today. One is Second Life, which has been around for a long time. At the time that I used it as an artist, um, I was sponsored by IBM. IBM used to have a virtual exhibition space um, that it would give artist, artist residencies to um, people and then they would come in this way. You can see on the left is my avatar. Um, and at this stage, I was given an island, basically a virtual island by IBM and to do with, to do with what, I ple what pleased me. So in this case, I was focusing on Afrofuturism and doing Afrofuturist cultural production. And so the very first thing I did when I got the island is that I covered, I sort of terraformed the land so it looked like the surface of the moon. So you can actually see my avatar sort of floating above the space as I was working. And you can see the moon uh, texture on the ground behind me. So that was just, and so there's a difference in, in that kind of exhibition versus Kunst Matrix, which is current, um, kind of uh, what a lot of schools have been using to do uh, gallery exhibitions, um, gallery uh, shows, and um, in, even in thesis exhibitions. So uh, you see there's a plan there. Um, actually, you're given some layouts. And so in the difference between the two is that they're giving you a layout or layouts to choose from as opposed to Second Life where the layout is up to me or the person who's creating the, the space. So there are no walls yet, and then I create what I want. And I think I really want to make the distinction between a virtual 3D space that is like Kunst Matrix, where you're, you're giving rooms in which to put work in versus the Second Life, where you don't have to make it look like an actual space in real life. It could be something totally from your imagination. And so there is a difference there. Um, this is a screenshot of the entrance to the exhibition, um, Alternate Futures, Afrofuturist Multiverses and Beyond. Um, you can see that um, there's a date. This is all set up by IBM. They had this placard for our residents and um, it was even curated. So there was a curator who greeted uh, people as avatars as they came into the exhibition and then they could just go in. Um, so this is again, um, creating kind of a different type of virtual 3D experience. Um, as you are in the space, not as a kind of first person shooter like in video games, but you're in there as an avatar and you can control the avatar with arrows and um, other uh, um, options um, on your computer, on your screen. This is the uh, navigation for Kunst Matrix, which is, this is the MFA uh, thesis show from 2020 for MassArt. And you can see that there has some navigation options, but you don't get a chance to make it the space look anything other than what the template has um, provides. So um, you're gonna be navigating a template basically by, and you can put artwork on the walls or in the, on the floor and things like that. Um, use the arrow keys um, to go up and down. Um, you can also um, move around um, other ways in the space. So these are two types of virtual 3D spaces. 
So, um, so preparation is you want to sort of meet with the curator and or sponsors and organizers to talk about what you're going to be doing and then create a schedule of events or milestones for that. It could be a theme or a series of themes or sub themes um, underneath one umbrella. And then you enter your exhibition content and promotion dates to the schedule. And what I'm going to talk about is how to create, how to create an inventory with names, titles, and media types ensuring digital content is high quality and the proper format, which is really important. Um, creating digital t uh, templates for uh, or guides for submissions. Um, so you're telling people who are submitting work, what quality, what uh, is the type of uh, file format you wanna use and what the quality needs to be in terms of resolution, for example. Um, and then creating a the layout for the space. Um, either you create it yourself or you're using a layout that's prepackaged and offered to you or you purchase it. Um, and so there's also this information here in terms of a checklist, uh, contact information for all the people involved, especially the curators. I'm going to talk about touring the space in a second, but um, getting used to the space. So when I did uh, curate the MFA thesis show, I went to another show that was in the same space so I could understand Kunst Matrix to understand how the space worked, which is very different from Second Life in many ways. Um, then you choose the layout or create it and then use the layout as, uh, and the inventory to assign spots for works. Um, and then also creating a post, uh, creating um, and posting up a curatorial statement. So I'm going to stop sharing um, now and um, uh, switch to a different um, uh, switch to a different tab. So I'm going to show you um, Kunst Matrix now. So bear with me here. And so Kunst Matrix. I'm going to show Kunst Matrix, and I'm going to show the Second Life space. So I'm going to show you the difference. So let's look at Kunst Matrix. Okay, so you should see it on your screen. So when you do go to the link, it shows you a, it gives you a little placard up front and tells you where you're at. And then there's a navigate, there's a button at the bottom that says uh, enter exhibition. There's also another button at the bottom that says start a guided tour. And you'll see there's a little, that's a, possibly an option. This is an old show. So I'm just gonna stick with the enter exhibition. So you go there, you click on it. Um, and then you're able to use the arrow keys to sort of move around. You can also move your uh, your mouse around the space. And so these are just different works from different um, of the grad students that year, uh, that summer. And you notice that there, in some cases, there are, there's music for some of the projects. So to prepare each one of these pieces, the um, student had to submit it in a certain file format. In this case, um, this image was submitted where there was no background except for the drop shadow to create that sense of three dimensionality, um, create a three, sense of three being three dimensional. Um, and so that was, so there are some certain uh, changes that need to be made as opposed to just submitting a painting or a photograph. As you can see here, this is a, a drawing and then um, for that student. So you can just kind of move around your mouse or you can use the arrow keys to see the different works. Sound can be attached in a particular area if it relates to that uh, person's space. But I wanna talk about the three-dimensional objects. So if I go forward here for this particular artist, you can see that there are sculptures in front of some of the pieces. And so in order to create that, this is basically, um, a series of images um, that were sort of uh, added, put together, combined to create this three-dimensional version of the sculpture. And when you click on it, you can actually see the sculpture from um, different angles. And it has some information on the right side of the screen, um, the artist name, the title. There might be some other information. There's an I for information button that you can click on. It gives you the uh, dimensions and the medium or media used to create the work. And this is a three-dimensional physical object. And um, 
when you're done with that, you can exit that view and continue to um, move around. But you are in a white box, um, typical gallery type of space that's uh, given to you in Consumatrix. Same thing for here. Um, this is a you know basket with apples, you know, but you know from the artist's point of view. And um, this last one. Notice in the background, you see that it's sort of rotating in the round. And so if I just let this uh, sit here, it'll give you two or three views of the sculpture. And then behind it, you can see the rest of the room kind of moving around in like an animated uh, sequence behind it. And so um, this is a, a kind of your, your standard gallery view your, uh, experience. So if you were to prepare for this artist to prepare their work for this white box space, this particular artist has a long kind of butcher block paper or a long roll. So obviously there has to be some tiling involved. Um, for some of them, there's also situations where you want don't want a white background. And so there ha it has to come in as a um, PNG file um, as opposed to a JPEG file. Um, for most of the images you're gonna have in any online gallery is gonna be um, it, uh, ping or uh, PNG, PNG or JPEG and not TIFF or some of the print-based file formats. And so you're um, kind of restricted to that. Um, and also resolution in terms of is it high res versus um, something that you would put up on Twitter, which wouldn't matter. Um, but you can see some examples in this image. We have a white background um, and it's very long. And on the right, we have um, some, Im some images of jewelry, I believe this is. And there's no background, so that is if there is if they're hanging from the, uh, on the wall. So trying to create um, a space, uh, an experience um, that you would see in a physical gallery in real life, but by using um, different tips and tricks um, in the space. One more room here, I believe. You're also able to, um, in addition to two-dimensional works and um, using images to stitch together and make three-dimensional sculptures. You're able to also um, show video. So this one is a video playing on a loop of the student's work that's happening here. And you can see if you can click on it, it gives you some information and the video continues to play. In this case, the artist and the title, if you click the I for information button, it tells you it's a video documentation of mixed media sculpture and site-specific ins installation. And um, so you can look at it this way, or you can ex exit out of the detail view and look at it on the wall, as it would be in a gallery. And then if there were sound, you would hear the sound as well. So all these are different things you could do. So this is Kunz Matrix. There are other spaces similar to this, where you're given um, kind of a room or a template design, and then you can just put work up on the wall. So those are your typical white box layout for exhibition. And so the next thing I'm gonna show um, is, I'm gonna switch over to a different window and show you um, a, a, a second life version um, of uh, an exhibition. And so I'm gonna share my screen again. And so this one is just a, a walkthrough. So this space doesn't exist anymore. And um, so someone has recorded um, their experience going through the exhibition, but you have kind of an entry point here is I created in this case, kind of a portal that walks you up in, into the exhibition. And I'm, I'm gonna, and one more thing, um, on the left side of the screen is a map and on the map, it has an eye, just like the same eye button from the Kunz Matrix. There is an information button that you can click on to get more information about the exhibition. Um, so you'll see that throughout this. Um, and that was created by me. Uh, so basically, I took a brought two-dimensional um, file formats, um, JPEGs, and brought them into um, Second Life and uh, textured an object with them and then added it to the, to the, to the display. And then you can see that it's, you know, you can click on these kind of, um, there's these uh, pink and, and golden um, kind of orbs. You can click on that teleport 
you to a different part of the exhibition, which is way different from Cunt's Matrix, where you have to use the arrow keys or go from room to room. Here you can actually create um, a, a buttons that allow you to teleport to any place that um, you want. Um, so there's teleportation allowed um, in Second Life. So I'm gonna play it a little bit just so you get a sense of it. It's a little artistic, so it's not like a straight uh, walkthrough, but you do get to see some of the features that you wouldn't see in a white box um, exhibition type of space. skip ahead a little bit. Um, in fact, I'm gonna play with one more minute of this. The differences between um, these two things is really important. One is kind of in the box and the other one is outside of the box. And let me pull up the PowerPoint again and talk about some of the other differences um, in terms of planning the space and preparation for the space. Um, let me see, uh, let me share my screen. 
again, had to do this because um, I'm, I'm going back and forth between uh, different uh, software, <laughs> online versus PowerPoint. Um, so we're back to here and um, get in presentation mode. And so one of the differences in Second Life is the objects that you create for your exhibition can be solid. They can also be um, uh, where you can walk through them. They're flexible so that you can make it um, so that objects, you can walk through them. So you could have something that appears to be solid and um, something right next to it that is solid. So if you wanted someone that say to build a bridge, but you wanted everything to be, uh, you have a series of objects you could walk through to experience some immersion, you could do that in Second Life um, as opposed to Kunst Matrix where everything is solid and um, there's no ability to walk through things. Um, additionally, you can make um, objects transparent. And so you could see objects behind objects. So you could have a series of uh, you know, uh, displays or sculptures and then have like um, some sort of walking mechanism stairs or something like that that is uh, transparent. So you still see the artwork or the work that's on view and still are able to sort of walk and navigate around in a different way. So there are really no rules, so to speak, um, in, the terms, in the way that you would uh, lay out a Second Life exhibition. Um, but I did have a, a plan. And so the plan that I had, I had to create on my own. So I didn't get a template like you would get in Kunst Matrix. I created a plan that said, okay, there's gonna be a bridge through the middle of the exhibition. And then on the, on the left, there would be a utopia. On the right would be dystopia. And for each one of the left and the right um, sections, there would be two exhibition areas or two simulations. Um, for each, so there was like a you know kind of a, a loose plan that I work with, but that was created by in, my, in this case the artist, not by the gallery or by the by IBM. Um, they just gave me a flat piece of uh, virtual land, and for Kunst Matrix is a whole um, different experience where you're um, choosing which types of layouts that you want that's um, out of the box, and then you're choosing um, you're kind of constrained. Um, in, in many more ways than you are with Second Life. And again, there some people will really need that because they just want a white gallery or a white box gallery experience as opposed to um, a very open and um, fewer constraints type of space where anything kind of kind of goes. Um, and so that's uh, the difference. And so touring the space is important. You want to see how to navigate the space. You want to see how people would get information if they wanted it. Are there placards? Are there um, you know, things you need to create virtually that would let people know that where they're at versus where they may wanna go? Um, how do they navigate? Are they navigating with an avatar? Are they navigating with the keyboard um, using the arrow keys or their mouse or trackpad on their laptops? So what is the uh, navigation? Um, and you might even think about who your audience is. If the, the kind of people going into the exhibition space are not really gonna be in av are not used to avatars and things like that, um, you may go with something that's a little more constrained and they um, are used to arrow keys, they can use that. Um, so create, and, or you may wanna have a variety of different ways to navigate like this example. Um, if you're doing something like Hunts Matrix, you want to manage your submissions. So when you get the submissions, you upload it to Hunts Matrix. It gives you kind of a limit to how big the images can be, especially for video. And if you are buying a package, um, usually get a package full of, uh, with like two or three spaces, uh, types of spaces for your uh, exhibition, plus um, how many images or how much uh, storage you get to uh, put the work in. So as opposed to IBM, I kind of had unlimited access because of IBM bought the island, but in Kunst Matrix, you have a limit. And so you can't go over a certain amount or a certain storage capacity for that particular package you purchased um, for that. So you can see that uh, this is a, a screen where you can see the, some artwork that's been submitted and you can um, see the medium and it kind of gives you a thumbnail and then you just have that um, and you can use that inventory to uh, begin to think about how you're going to lay it out um, in the space. And then you create the layouts. This is the layout that I created for the Kunst Matrix show using this particular space you see on the left. Um, I did create a legend or key um, for this uh, layout that I did in Google Doc in a Google Doc. 
Um, so circles are sculptures, uh, squares are uh, 2D work, and then the triangles are video and audio. Um, and then I color coded it per, uh, for each person or each artist or each student. So the blue is one student, the pink color or salmon color is another student and so on. And then you can see on the far right is the name and sort of sometimes it's the medium or whether it's 2D or video or 3D um, in terms of what goes on the walls in those spots. Um, I even did a A, B, C, D situation where um, I was thinking about the juxtaposition of different works to make sure that there's a flow in the space. Um, and even my little description of what uh, that space is, uh, the theme of the space. So in this case, domesticity, um, these artworks explore the private space of the home, home life, and our economics of home. So each space had its own like theme. Um, so this is how I did the the cura curation and 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 preparation and and all that for the consummatrix space, as opposed to very open experience in Second Life. Um, the curatorial statement is in each space. We had two different ex exhibition spaces in Kunz Matrix because it was a large class in terms of students, but there was a curator statement in each one of those spaces. And this is what I wrote. Um, and it's posted up just the way you would do in traditional gallery space on the wall. And people, once you're in the space, you could read that um, curatorial statement. So that part is important as well for this type of exhibition. And then we've looked at this already. So you can see that you have two dimensional works and three dimensional works. And this is an example of uh, work on the floor. So on some of these uh, the templates that you could uh, get from Kunst Matrix, you can actually create art um, uh, lit and sort of uh, put it on the floor as opposed to um, the walls. So um, in addition, and still 2D, but it is a, a particular thing you have to have set up before you um, come in with the work. So the student, I had to meet with the student. The student, it was important for them to let me know that this work had to be on the floor. So we had to make sure we chose a space for that to happen. Um, this one has um, a couple of 3D kind of sculptures. As you would move around this space, you would see a different view um, of the sculptures on the on the stage or platform. And then in the center is um, a video that plays. And I showed you how the video works in Guns Matrix before. And um, and then the student the student had four different um, sculptures in addition to the video. And this this is their area in the space. So I do um, want to point out, you can look at, uh, there's the Vimeo of the IBM exhibition um, walkthrough that someone recorded, and you can actually still go into Kunz Matrix and see these two shows, uh, these two parts, part one and part two of the uh, thesis show for um, the Mass Art 2020 MFA thesis show. So um, I think we can, and I want to, there's a, I'm sure people have questions. So I want to give some time for people to ask questions or have a conversation. Um, and, um, you know, we can start there and see if there are any questions. I know there's and people may have, especially about the second life stuff or even about Kunz Matrix, that type of work. Yeah, we have some questions. Thanks for giving us a chance here. Sure. Um, one of the one of the ones that came up pretty recently. If you can just talk a little bit about the cost of the different uh, platforms, especially in in maybe in particular the packages that you were mentioning in, in Kunz Matrix. Um, I know they're expensive. <laughs> I also know I I'm the curator, so I had nothing to do with mass art purchase. Did the um, some people higher up made the purchases with Kunz Matrix. They do have packages on their website. So you can actually go there and see what types of things you would get. Um, I think if you're a, a small organization, um, you probably won't have a little cost prohibitive in some ways, but they may have smaller packages so that you just won't, won't have as much space. Sure. Um, in this case, this was, um, I think three main spaces. Um, and I feel like it was really expensive. <laughs> and uh, each one of those, um, we had to sort of figure out how many two dimensional works could go in this space, how many videos, maybe one or two. Um, I had to think about not putting two videos side by side because that would confuse the, the visitor. 
So, sure. you know, one, two, I had to think about, okay, the student has work that has audio in it or has work that has video and audio in it. So I put them away from, you know, others who do that so that, you know, just when you're in, in that small space, you hear it. And then when you walk away um, for a couple of millimeters, it goes away. And all that had to be thought about um, for the cunts matrix situation. Sure. Are there any um, <clears throat> are there any platforms that you might that have you no that you've noticed that are more cost effective for smaller organizations or anything that you might recommend in that direction? Um, Live Arts or something like that in New York, um, they did a very similar to Cunts Matrix type of exhibition. I'm not sure what platform they used, but I had a, a couple of two dimensional works in that. Um, some of this, uh, you know, if coming, coming from Second Life into something like that for me is just maddening because I, I don't, I, I like the freedom because in Second Life I could fly around in some cases and yeah. go from place to place or teleport. And then I'm really, but I'm going from room to room the way I would. Um, but during the pandemic, it was important to have that because people can't do that in real life um, when that, you know, as opposed to 2010 when, you know, people could go into galleries and museums and I have to worry about social distancing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but the platform was very similar in terms of how you navigate. So you still had white walls, you still had the white, uh, white box gallery or um, exhibition space, but it wasn't Cunts Matrix and it was going through a different platform. So sure. maybe, and I can, um, if people want to ask me about it, I can ask them about it, um, how, what they used, but it's very similar in terms of setup. I would encourage you as well as the audience to engage the the learning hub and the and the communities that are in there and especially around this particular mm -hmm. module. Yes. They'll continue to have have questions. I'm I'm sure we'll forward them along to you as well. But do do take a look at that and and if you if you want you can engage everyone there as well. Um, mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Let me let me check this sheet here and ask another question. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, can, can you, as as the curatorial team, provide the typical piece details and credits on a placard, um, what you would include digitally? So, um, see. There was a difference in, um, for a Kunst Matrix, the student, we had a couple of students who could not do Kunst Matrix. Wow. Their work, because of the way it was being planned, it was outdoors, it was part of nature, you know, for, you know and you couldn't get, the, you couldn't simulate that. Yeah. Um, in the kind of matrix space, so they opted out, um, and they right. did like a special, you know, found this way to do it um, with a few people um, for credit. But um, so there were a couple students who couldn't use the space, but most of the students were able to do that. Um, and so they had to submit the dimensions, but obviously you were not experiencing those dimensions in kind of matrix. We're really experiencing it for however you know tall that that you know virtual wall is. Yeah. So the information you get um, for each work is the real work, the physical work, not the work in you know that you view that you're viewing in Kunst Matrix. I think that's an important distinction to make. Sure. Um, so they had to treat it in a sense like you're doing a physical exhibition, but there were a lot of things that had to be done behind the scenes. Um, so in the, and the most complicated was the 3D sculpture work. That's not 2D. It's actually 3D, but it's a bunch of two-dimensional images attached or combined to create that effect. Makes sense. Okay, let me see. Do these Kunst uh, Matrix gallery exhibits only live in Kunst Matrix, or yeah. can you add them? Okay, so they don't yeah. go into the website. Yeah, you have to go through the platform, through the website. Okay. Same for a sec Second Life and the other one, the Live Arts. You had to go through their portal into the space, and so. You can't save it to your computer. You can do a walkthrough and record the way that the Second Life was done. I did a walkthrough of the Cunts Matrix space as well. So you can do a, a video walkthrough, but you can't download it. Gotcha, gotcha. Makes and then once you're, I guess once your contract is up, the space is gone. <laughs> so it's ephemeral. It doesn't exist forever. Okay, that makes sense too. Yeah. All right, let me see. Uh, one of the big benefits we've seen in the in-person exhibits is the ability for viewers to interact with each other to ask questions. Is this possible in that in that platform? Uh, interactivity. The Kunst Matrix does it allow for that Second Life like no um, uh, user interactivity? Not okay. at all. Gotcha. Um, yeah, you can maybe be in there, but you won't. See, there's no avatar. Um, so you don't, you don't see anybody. It's just you going through the space, but you may be going in at the same time as your 
your peer sure. and you can talk about it if you get on the phone, gotcha, gotcha. you can't do it in world. You can't do it in the space. Right. Um, I suppose the second life where you can actually speak and have conversations with people or text them in a sense. Interesting. Um, do you do you see a, a re retaining relevance for Second Life because of that? Those types of things, or is it sort of being uh, surpassed by some of these other? Uh, it's There's a lot of confusion about Second Life for a long time because a lot of people thought it was a video game. Ah. Um, you see the avatar, you see people moving around. It looks like a video game, and that's not what it was. It was a you know simulation of things. It was you know art galleries. It was museums. It was libraries, you name it. Um, and so there was a, you know, and then it was the time. People weren't quite ready to move into that type of space. IBM and other companies, companies like Dell, they would buy these islands in Second Life and try to figure out how we could, how they could use it for what they do. Yeah. And so I guess IBM said we can give artists residencies and we can see, you know, you know, and I did a tour for IBM ex employees of my um, exhibition as well. Um, but that didn't last, and so and it cost money. So the kind of you know the kind of uh, freedom that I had for the IBM exhibition, I wouldn't have as an artist by because it cost too much money. Similar to it's not you know cheap. Um, same with Consumatrix. So it's very cost prohibitive for individual artists um, in the long term. But for a company or for a large institution, it's definitely a possibility for both sides, Consumatrix and for Second Life and other platforms. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right, shifting gears here. What are the best ways to document digital exhibitions, especially in these proprietary walled garden type of platforms? So my walkthrough and Cunts Matrix is just through my Mac using my uh, image capture software. So I, um, I have a newer computer, so there is a, a image capture option that I use and then I just put it in video mode and just walk through, you know, use my arrow key and navigate through the gallery and then save that you know, as a video uh, file. Um, so that's one way to do it, is use screen capture software to do that kind of walkthrough. Okay, super. Um, let me see here. Okay, can you please comment on the support of uh, WCAG or ADA guidelines by each of these software products? Is there a mechanism to provide an alt text or a machine readable descriptions for these exhibits? It wasn't for Cunts Matrix, but I know that a lot of work was done for that in Second Life okay. um, and possibly for some other platforms that I don't have any used. Sure. Um, but definitely, um, um, I didn't. it didn't come up for this particular um, exhibition because the students were, um, it was an issue for them. But I know because there's sound and you know there was even a way to do interpreter uh, type of things in Second Life for people um, uh, with their readers and things like that. So that was something that I've seen um, happen in on the Second Life space. Great. Um, is there a is is there a difference in usability between the desktop and mo mobile devices and that type of thing, or is is one preferred over the other in terms of access? Um, I don't know how, e um, maybe for a tablet or an iPad, but I don't think walking through a walkthrough of a gallery space on a mobile device would work very well. Um, sure. Because you need navigation, you need to be able to um, use your trackpad or your, the arrows to be able to go through. Now, that doesn't mean that you couldn't set up a virtual reality gallery. I didn't talk about that much. I talked about virtual 3D, but the virtual 3D also includes VR. So you could, in theory, do a VR experience that's immersive, um, using um, something that you know, like a you know white box gallery situation, or even like a Second Life type of exhibition, and then you're just moving through um, using either something you hold in your hands or something um, from your headset. So right. that is, that that would be the answer to some of those issues around not using your computer, uh, using a different device. It's sure. still another device, and it still doesn't mean you get to talk to people and right. have, interact with people because you're in your own space with their headset. Sure. Um, are, does do these platforms that you mentioned support those VR headsets? Which virtual platforms support VR um, headsets? I don't think, but again, I've only used um, Constant Matrix for this uh, particular show, um, thesis show. Um, I don't recall. 
their beam. However, I do know that people are using like Unity 3D and um, similar um, applications to create virtual exhibitions for VR. Great. So you could create um, um, design using Unity 3D. It's usually used for games, but uh, you could actually use that space for exhibition. I've seen that before. Super. Um, and I think the other thing to think about is what's the skill, what is your skill set? Meaning whoever's planning to do this, or can you get the person that has the skill set to be able to create that space or environment? Um, if not, you're using out of the box kind of things like Cunts Matrix um, to be able to create. And that's for, for some people who don't have a lot of time and um, our skills, that's gonna work for them. Sure. Um, how do you, is there a way on this to track visitor engagement? Do you have a post e-visit surge on your own website, perhaps? You can create, um, um, I'm sh you're, just like with um, websites, Comes Matrix keeps track of who visits. Um, so you can get traffic of um, information data from both sites. Um, you can actually have it, I remember having, I like not a sensor, but some, some, some kind of script that read how many people give you kind of a number or how many times people pass through a particular spot. So you could um, you know, get a number from that in terms of visitors. Sure. Pretty, not easily, but um, it's de definitely something that's been done before. Great, okay. Um, we mentioned a little bit about accessibility. Um, it's something, it's one of the overall themes for our project here, for the Digital Empowerment mm -hmm. Project, and that's where we started um, with, our, with our modules. Um, is there uh, a site impaired accessibility for, for any of these, like a um, audio embedded type of type of feature, I guess? Um, there is for Second Life, I know that much. Um, there is for Second Life. Um, I was trying to see, um, I don't see much for Cunts Matrix at all, but I also think that if you did an immersive experience with VR, you'd be able to perhaps build it in for um for that experience um in terms of sound sure. or text yeah. cool if you have um as with many things on the web um if you have someone in house or know someone who can build it from scratch it usually tends to be the best bet um especially if you want to do it over and over again and it's more cost you know may put a lot of money into it in the, front, in the beginning, but if you're gonna be doing these type of shows all the time, like we don't know, there might be Delta, then after that, the Sigma, whatever type right, of variant right, right. comes up. If you do have a plan B, you'd have that in, you know, possibly that plan B in, um, that you could pull out and to be able to still do a show except virtually. Sure. Um, okay, so <clears throat> who, who owns the rights to the content that you're doing? Is it the institution or Kunst Matrix because it's licensed? Uh, you an agreement, um, especially on Kunst Matrix side, it belongs to the artist. Huh. Um, you know, so they don't, you know, they can't do anything with the work once it's uploaded. In fact, uh, it's highly likely um, that, you know, if you stop paying for the account, you know, that they all just, you know, get rid of everything and move mm -hmm. on to the next because it takes up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And um, it probably requires a lot of server and storage capacity on the side of the company. Okay, keep. I got, got more questions coming in. We're gonna keep them coming at you. Uh, do you recommend working with university classes or other student groups to bring in this kind of technical expertise when it's not on staff at the museum uh, or the museum can't afford it? Uh, have you seen collaborations like that work? Uh, what are possible pitfalls? So in the case of the MSFA thesis show, it just so happens that those particular students are my former students. So I knew every single one of the students. So that was nice to be able to sort of cap off their experience, but I had them a year before, but they had an internal team of people in the graduate, in the graduate office who d did a trainings in Kunst Matrix. And they were the ones, not me, um, to collect the work. So they had to you know, work with me and others to create the guide. So here's the guide for all the ways you would save your files. This is you know, all the different things you need to do in terms of guidelines um, was created by the in-house st in staff. Um, and they just went to a training. And um, I know that the first time they did a show, uh, it wasn't very, it was, it was problematic for the 3D work. 
Um, and then they learned and then maybe the platform got better. So they just kind of built on their skills from the year before for the new show. And so it was just the same people, but now they've learned and what to do and what not to do from the previous uh, example. Um, it's really hard to get, um, when you have, when you do train staff in-house, that means that even if you would consult with someone, if something were to happen, there's troubleshooting that needs to happen, or there's some kind of other technical issue, um, there's some knowledge in-house um, that um, people, someone say, oh, you know, I think I can figure that out, or I think I know where to look to find um, an answer to that problem. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's it. And then, you know, it's not always easy collaborations because um, you kind of have to uh, create a, have a, a, a conversation about who's doing what. Like if I'm a curator, you know, there are things that I need to have. Like I need to know the space. I need to know what I'm working with. I need to be able to select the spaces. Like I need to say, okay, this is a good space. This is a good space. It, um, and I had to, you know, be able to, you know, meet with the artists and also be able to to plan out and tell and, and pick the images and pick the work and know how it's going to work in that space. And then how it had to happen prior as part of the preparation um, to even putting images in the space. So workflow. Yeah. So getting the workflow down can, especially the first time out, can be very difficult. When I was doing the IBM, the curator said, you have the whole space, do whatever you want. And then they would just check in. So I, did, I could do whatever I was doing. There was no, you know, I had a curator, but the curator was hands off. Mm -hmm. um, it was a different experience, different type of situation as opposed to Consumatrix, which is 20 people had to be um, on view, their work on view. And all of them had different issues. It had to be on the floor. It had to be, you know, um, with no background and look like it's three dimensional. It had to be, you know, uh, 3D. And so it had to be positioned this way in front of the painting. Uh, you know, this, these are all issues that had to be um, created. I had to go in, um, the technical people were good, but I figured out because of my second life experience, I figured out Cuts Matrix pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So if I needed there to be a platform somewhere and people were taking their time, I put the platform there and put the, you know, yeah. get the, to do the, you know, place where it was supposed to go. Um, so that was, uh, you know, you had to. Yeah. Is that is that work in Second Life still available? Can people visit it? No, no that was twenty ten. So right. yeah, IBM that's... doesn't even IBM doesn't even exist in the space anymore. Understood. Yeah, yeah, I thought I thought you mentioned that, but I wanted to I wanted to kind of maybe reiterate. Did you did you capture it up onto YouTube or anything like that? You said you did. A so video. what I played is someone did a walkthrough of everything and okay. um, put it on Vimeo and then gave me the files. So if that goes away, I still have that walkthrough nice. that nice. they recorded. Okay. If you have a link, I know that folks are interested in it. Right, oh, sure. I definitely have a link. Um, I don't know where to put it. Do I put it in chat? Throw it into that private chat, and we will get it up to the to the audience. Okay. And uh, um, well, let's, let's not hold us up too much, but I'll, we'll get that out right away. Yeah, there it you is. You can actually still go into Cunt's Matrix as well. So I'll give you the hyper um, allerg allergic um, article that has the links at the bottom nice. for the uh, Cunt's Matrix shows, which you can nice. still go into. It's exciting. All right, I think we have we have time for like one more question, and then I have to talk talk you uh, off the script again. Sure. Um, all right. Let's see how how much experience does one need to have if doing this on their own? Like like they don't have a IT department. Uh, is there is there a need to do things like three D scans, or does Kunst Matrix allow you to do that within the software? No, it all had to be done. Like the three D works had to be photographed by the in house staff. Um, you know, there had to be arrangements to, to do, you know, some professional photography it had to be well lit. Um, it can be the students using their iPhones and taking, you know, had to be really uh, quality to look good online. It had to be uh, high quality. Sure. So this, uh, mm -hmm. just capping it off. I mean, this is less than easy for a small team of a, a museum to do. I mean, most, a lot of our audience that we're aiming at is, is sort of mm -hmm in-house team of, of professionals that don't have, that are doing jack of all trades stuff. Let's put it that way. And is there a way that we can direct them towards something that would help them or prime, uh, prime them on that? Um, my suggestion for a lot of places, not just for, um, you know, universities and colleges and stuff, but even, you know, smaller institutions is to start investing, just like you would invest in a social media person to handle promotions and marketing is to start looking at, 
um, virtual exhibition expertise in house. Sure. And it could be a part of a, you know, maybe this, you know, there's a part of the job is social media or maybe some other type of technology in house, could be the IT person, but somehow that there's some knowledge in house, they get training or something like that, that gives them this type of experience so that when it is, if it does come to, if there's another pandemic or it's another situation where it needs to be online, um, uh, the organization can be able to hit the ground running. Um, yeah. And so, you know, that's what I would suggest. It's very, um, it is a specific skill set. Um, but I will say because I, the exhibition for IBM was 2010. I was not in IBM in the second life through my PhD studies. And then um, only recently in the last year that I go back into year and a half, go back into second life, for example. But then I, the skills that I gained from the experience of putting in a show to experiencing uh, second life was I could use that for Cuts Matrix. Yeah. I pretty easily was able to figure out on my own without training how to set objects down and just kind of played around in the, so you need someone kind of like that, someone who has um, enough experience to be able to roll with it, no matter what the platform is. And I, I have one, one that I have to ask. So you, you've got in experience in virtual and in physical worlds. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you decide which environment to choose for a given show? Do you ever try to use both physical and digital spaces for the same exhibition? I think that's uh, I, interesting. I did work with uh, Linden Labs when it was they were local. And uh, they're the ones that had uh, you know, our own second life. And we did a mixed reality type of exhibition where there was a feed coming from the gallery into second life. And then the, there was a screen in the gallery so they could see what was happening in second life in the physical gallery. So it was a two way um, experience. So people who couldn't be physically be in the space could still see what was happening in the exhibition. Um, and it just been, you know, some things behind the scenes to make that happen but we were able to do a live um, video feed into Second Life for the exhibition that was physical and in, um, in the gallery. Do you know of any work that's being done that's similar to that? Because I know that's that seems to be like right at the center of what's trying to happen right now, right? I, mean, I feel I like, it, you know, it depends on the, um, if you any any application or platform they can take a live feed. Um, so using um, OSS, it's called, uh, it's on, losing online streaming services or different um, protocols. Uh, you could, you know, in theory, be able to do live events, um, having that come into the virtual space. Awesome. You know, I'd keep going, but we're on a time limit. So I really appreciate this. We we appreciate this at the Digital sure. Empowerment Credit. And uh, uh, just let me uh, give a couple closing remarks. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Gaskins, for sharing your experience with us. Um, um, after each module, all four videos will be available on our website. So this is the last of the four uh, sessions. Uh, so we'll be compiling the module here in the next couple of weeks. That'll be, uh, all of it will be together. I very much appreciate you letting me be the host for this set of sessions that make up this module. Uh, it's been a privilege for me to interact with all the folks who have presented throughout this last month uh, plus. Um, please visit the forum and our website, as I've mentioned. Um, sign up to the forum. Follow us on social media and stay aware of future programs. Uh, join us next week, uh, September 9th, 2021, uh, for, uh, for getting inspired about podcasting. It'll be a fun one. It's the intro session with some folks like yourselves that have done it before. So thank you again and, uh, and enjoy your week.